Happy February, everybody. And since we are in February, the month of love and Valentine's Day is just around the corner, I thought I would take this month and talk about what I consider some of the most romantic movies that I can think of. And just as a disclaimer, these are movies that a 25-year-old nerdy guy considers romantic, and it's by no means an objective list. And if you're expecting a bunch of Nora Ephron rom-coms, well, this is not exactly the month for you. But if that is something you're into, I do have a Nora Ephron playlist, and I highly suggest checking them out. She has made some of the most incredible rom-coms ever made. I can't argue with that. But let's start off with a movie that has probably the most misleading title ever. <laughs> The Princess Bride. Now, The Princess Bride may not technically be a misleading title because Buttercup, she's a princess, she's a main character, and she's a bride. Okay, fair enough. But that's not really what I mean by it being a misleading title. Because for me, growing up, whenever I'd see this movie at Blockbuster or Best Buy or on streaming, whenever it'd pop up for a long time before I actually watched it, I would just think, oh, it's a romantic, like sappy, Pride and Prejudice type movie, a little Jane Austen culture and romance, and that just never appealed to me. With the name of The Princess Bride, it just feels so girly and feminist. It just gives off the same energy as something like 27 Dresses. Definitely not for my demographic. But then, when I actually watched the movie, it's really not like that at all. It's actually a very clever, satirical take on fantasy adventure movies, which, hey, I love Lord of the Rings, I love Robin Hood and Zorro and all those swashbuckling adventures, and this movie seems to be a big send-up to that, along with some fairy tale tropes. What's not to like? But you don't get any of that, aside from maybe the fairy tale aspect, from the title. It just doesn't include any of the awesome action or adventure that we get in this movie. But I'm getting ahead of myself, because if you don't know already, The Princess Bride is a pretty famous framing device where it is a book, it's a story that a grandfather is telling his sick grandson. And the grandfather is played by Columbo himself, Peter Falk, and I just love that man. Peter Falk is probably one of my favorite actors ever. I have the whole box set of Columbo back there on the shelf. It's probably my favorite crime show ever, and Peter Falk just has this dry sense of humor, this I know better than you. And I'm not gonna rub it in your face, but I'm gonna let you know just enough what I think about you to make you uncomfortable and then I'm just gonna let it sit there and weirdly enough he brings that same energy to the role of the grandfather in this movie to young Fred Savage who's the kid in this and it's so funny because Fred Savage is known for being this adult trapped in a little kid's body all the roles that he got as a little kid he always had to talk as this miniature adult and a lot of times it kind of came off as force but when you have that pitted up against Peter Falk with this condescending attitude it just points out the phoniness of a lot of other Fred Savage performances but here it makes sense because it's a kid trying to look and act tough to his grandfather, the grandfather just is taking none of it and is just calling him out on it. And I gotta give credit to Rob Reiner on this casting dynamic because he really could have chosen anybody to play these two characters. And he made a great call on these two guys. And you can tell from the first couple bits of dialogue that these guys are just gonna be magic together. But as great as their whole dynamic is, the opening to this movie isn't quite perfect because The Princess Bride, when I always think about it, I think about the adventure, the fantasy, this other world of Florin, this kind of timeless tale of love conquering evil and yeah it's a bit satirical and a bit of a parody of these types of movies kind of in the same way how Ella Enchanted or Shrek took jabs at fairy tale tropes but also working within the tropes to tell its own story. This is definitely the precursor to this type of movie. And for the most part, it feels pretty timeless. When they're in Florin and they're on this adventure, you feel like this movie could have been made at any time. It could have been made in the 40s, it could have been made in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even 10 years ago maybe it could have been made. Granted, if it was made 10 years ago, there's a shocking lack of CGI, so Okay, maybe it dates it a little bit just because there is no CGI, but it really does have that old school Hollywood style of a classic adventure story. That is, except for when it cuts back to the kid's bedroom, because you look at Fred Savage's bedroom and he's just dripping with the 80s. It just looks like the 80s threw up in his bedroom, which was kind of the thing to do at the time. You know, you looked at any young kid's bedroom in any movie in the 80s and it was just dripping with 80s. You look at the kid's bedrooms in E.T., for example, it definitely has that 80s feel. And this is no different, so on that level, I do have to dock it some timelessness 
points because it definitely feels like the 80s there. But thankfully when the grandfather starts reading the book and we're introduced to our love interest, Princess Buttercup played by Robin Wright and Wesley played by Carrie Elwes, we are transported to this magical world of fantasy and true love and these people love each other and that's where I get maximum enjoyment out of this movie. And the plot is pretty simple to understand. You have Wesley and Buttercup. Wesley is this farm boy and he goes off to seek his fortune, but his ship gets captured by the Dread Pirate Roberts and the Dread Pirate Roberts takes no prisoners. So everybody in Florin thinks he's dead. Now it looks like Buttercup is about to marry Prince Humperdinck, played by Chris Sarandon. And if you don't know who Chris Sarandon is, he's the voice of Jack Skellington. He was also in Fright Night and he's been in a few other things that I've seen him in recently. And the one thing I can say about him is even when he's in bad movies, he is always entertaining, and this is no exception. Him as Prince Humperdinck, he's the kind of character that's trying to be so masculine, but he's also so foppish and feminine too, that you just look at him and you're like, what are you? What are you trying to be? Who are you trying to prove yourself to? He's such a strange character, but you love to watch him because you never know what he's going to do next. But if you haven't figured it out yet, he's clearly the bad guy in this story. He's trying to marry Buttercup so that he can actually kill her to start war, which it's never fully explained why he wants to start this war, or this conflict, maybe it's some opportunistic thing, I don't know. It's not really important, it's not important to the story because again, this is a fairy tale, it's a romance, it's a sweeping adventure, you're not really supposed to question it with facts and logic. But the thing that kind of excuses it in this movie is that it knows it and it always has this kind of cynical, self-referential edge to it. Maybe it's not quite as obvious or in your face as with something like Shrek, but it's definitely there. You definitely get a sense that with the writing and the way words are phrased and the way characters bounce off of each other, nobody is taking this super seriously. And we get our first major plot development when Buttercup is kidnapped by these three travelers, these three mercenaries, Fizzini, Fezzik, and, and Dago Montoya. And these guys are great because if you just look at this trio, you're like, okay, y'all have a story because there's no way a giant played by Andre the Giant, a dwarf, which I don't know if he's supposed to be a dwarf, he's short, but he's definitely a Sicilian played by Wallace Shaw and in Dago Montoya, the Spaniard with expert level skill and fencing technique. There's no way they just happen to cross paths one day. It's such an odd collection that it immediately gets your attention and this trio is so wonderful to watch. They're so much fun. They all have their own little gimmicks and while they're taking Buttercup away they're being followed by this man in black, the dread pirate Roberts, the man that supposedly killed Wesley and captured his ship and did unspeakable things to the crew. He's following them up this steep cliff and again this is where the fairy tale tropes aren't just set dressing for this story, they are the story because the Dread Pirate Roberts, the man in black, has to face three challenges. And the number three actually pops up a lot in this movie and I don't think it's an accident because if you look at old fairy tales, the number three is also everywhere in those fairy tales. It's always in threes, three challenges, three wishes, three bears, three cups of porridge. The number three just seems to be the perfect number for a narrative device. And the first of the three challenges that the Dread Pirate Roberts faces is Indigo Montoya. They have this incredibly intricate fencing scene where they go at it, they fight, and it's very cordial, it's very polite. And I know this scene is pretty famous, so I won't linger on it too long, but I do want to mention that it is a great send-up to the classic sword fights of the Errol Flynn days or the Tyrone Powers Zorro. They are definitely taking inspiration from that and doing it very well. It's a very awesome sword fight to watch. It's so entertaining. But it also doesn't lose that satirical side where it kind of makes fun of itself, where they switch hands mid-fight with a way for the other person to pick up their sword and then they'll attack them. It's just these little moments of things where you recognize it as the audience where you're like, oh that's not real, that's a story, that's a fairy tale, that's a trope. And the movie never lingers on those moments too hard or calls too much attention to them. They just let it happen and then move on to the next exciting thing. But after the man in black beats Inigo Montoya, he goes on to his second challenge which is the giant Fezzik. Andre the Giant, they have a bit of a wrestling match, but you think, okay, there's no way he's going to beat Andre the Giant. He's a real wrestler, and just look at the size of him. But the man in black climbs up on his back and chokes him out, and Andre falls, and he just moves on to the next challenge, which is the battle of wits. So he had the battle of skill, of strength, and now it comes down to the wits. Because now we have Wallace Shawn, who you might not recognize, but you will definitely recognize his voice. He's 
the boss in The Incredibles. He's the principal in the Goofy movie, and he's just done a whole bunch of voice work. He just has such a specific voice that you hear it and you're like, I know that from somewhere. You might not be able to pinpoint it, but you've definitely heard that before. But their battle is over Iocane Powder. It's a very deadly poison. It's colorless, odorless, and he puts it in one of the goblets and now has Vizini choose which one it is, and they'll figure out who wins and who's dead. And after some very dizzying rationalizations, he pulls the old trick of what the heck is that? And while his back is turned, switches the cups and then chooses the one in front of him. And after they both drink, we find out that they were both poisoned and the man in black was building up an immunity to Iocane powder for the last six months and it was all a trick. But if you haven't figured it out yet, the man in black really isn't the Dread Pirate Robert. It's actually Wesley and Wesley is back to reclaim his bride. But before he does that, he wants to figure out why is she engaged to marry Prince Humperdinck in the first place? Did she never really care about him in the first place? Why did she move on so fast? I thought their true love was stronger than anything. Why is she doing this? So after a bit of teasing and a bit of back and forth, she finds out that, oh, it really is Wesley and she feels so bad and they start building their relationship anew. Now that she knows he's not dead, she's not gonna go through marrying Humperdinck. But Humperdinck isn't too happy about that, so he's chasing them through the forest, through the fire swamp, and after some pretty close encounters with fire and quicksand and rodents of unusual size they make it out but then they're cornered by all the armies of prince humperdinck and it looks like there's no way out so buttercup basically says okay i'll marry you but please don't hurt wesley let him go back to his ship in peace and humperdinck being the double crossing bad guy that he is he agrees to half of that that she'll marry him but he is not sending wesley back to his ship he's putting him in the pit of despair hooking him up to this machine that sucks out your energy by inflicting pain on you that ends up killing you over time and again following these fairy tale tropes it is around this point where you'd have your main character fall into some kind of despair either it's a depression metaphorically or physically or whether they're actually in like the pit of a whale like Jonah or Pinocchio but again it does track you know whether it's a metaphor or not here we have a literal pit of despair where he is experiencing the worst pain a human being can experience while his true love is about to marry another dude and it's in this pit of despair where Wesley actually dies mostly he's mostly dead which in the words of Miracle Max played by Billy Crystal mostly dead is slightly alive and he can work with that. But before we get to Miracle Max and the restoration of Wesley, we have to figure out what's going on with Indigo Montoya because he is on this revenge quest to kill the man that killed his father and scarred up his face when he was, I think, 11 years old, 12 years old, somewhere around there. And that's why he's been training adamantly with fencing his whole life to be the best of the best so that next time he will not lose. And he learns that his father's killer is in the castle. He's the count and with the help of Fezzik, they're gonna go storm the castle and he's gonna avenge his father, but he can't do that because they don't have a plan. They don't have the brain. Vizini's dead, so who's gonna come up with the plan? And he was thinking, wait, the man in black, he could do it. So through a magic sword guided by the spirit of his father, which again on the fairy tale, metaphorical level aren't most magic swords in stories whether it's star wars or king arthur guided by the spirit of a father figure and that leads them to the pit of despair where they can rescue wesley take him to miracle max get him revived but the problem with the magic pill is it takes about 15 minutes for potency to get him back to fully alive he's kind of weirdly paralyzed through a lot of the third act of this movie which if you were to watch the fencing scene from earlier and see nothing else after that and then i were to tell you that oh that guy the man in black he's going to be paralyzed during the third act climax i don't know if anybody would believe me and it actually is quite a subversion in itself to have your main hero unable to walk unable to move anything more than his head or his finger while the really exciting action and storming the gates is going on but that's just the type of movie this is it doesn't really play by the rules but as you might expect, Indigo does get vengeance for his father. He takes on the six-fingered man and he wins. And the paralyzed Wesley uses his verbal skills and his intellect. Basically bluffs Prince Humperdinck into thinking that they'll have a duel to the pain. And going through all of the details of that makes Humperdinck kind of give himself up, basically. He lets Buttercup tie him up and then they escape and live happily ever after. And that's basically The Princess Bride. There's not that much to really unpack here. It's a pretty simple story. It's a story within a story. It's got a great framing device, if not a little bit dated. And the actual story is such a timeless send up to fairy tales and that whole aesthetic and the tropes of it, they're all there. And it's satirical in a way that isn't overly cynical. It doesn't have to 
force social change or be super progressive for the sake of a very forced and contrived message that's trying to preach. No, you just get a sense that this is a beautiful story. It's a very romantic story. You really do buy the relationship between Carrie Elvis's Wesley and Robin Wright's Buttercup. Even though they don't really have a lot of lines together, it's just in the way they look at each other. They look at each other with such an earnestness and depth of feeling that you can't help but kind of get swept up in the romance of all of it. Which all adds up to a movie that's, yeah, pretty simple, but it's very smart and intentional with how it chooses to be simple. And that's actually a pretty complicated and difficult thing to pull off. But I turn it over to you guys, what do you think about The Princess Bride? I assume most of you have already seen this movie before. But whatever you think, let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. As always, I'm Colby, this is my Nerdy Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.